Hey Youtubers, I uh, haven't been around that much lately because I've been so busy doing other things but I had this sort of urge to make a video and I was browsing really through um, the video I wanted to do a Poonage video so uh, I was having a look through the old um, evolution creationism side of things and I came across Mr Wes Ferris and this interesting little video um, that I thought I would take a look at and we'll tear him to pieces. I'm Wes Ferris and in this live broadcast I will explain how it is impossible for single-celled organisms to randomly evolve into the more complex creatures that we see today. I have developed these concepts through scientific research thus they are accurate and inescapable. You will have to follow along closely in this broadcast as some of my concepts are difficult to understand for some and you may not quite grasp a full understanding in this live broadcast and have to listen again to this broadcast when the recorded version is posted. So listen closely and try to comprehend. Let's begin. Listen closely, try to comprehend. Let us begin. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, mentioned science in, in this bit. I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. Um, this could be quite interesting. In fact, um, science, that, that always interests me. Sadly, that's really the last reference to science that he has in most of the rest of the video. But um, yeah, I think the only science he's really looked at is in Answers in Genesis, uh, which isn't actually science, it just pretends to be. Um, anyway, let's get on. Uh, it's it's a long way to go, so let's go. A single-celled animal is not just a simple blob of protoplasm. It is a highly complex organism that is able to do everything that it needs to do in order to live and to reproduce all as one single, independent, living cell. It can move around, find its food, eat its food, digest its food, and dispose of waste. It can reproduce itself into the next generation. Likewise, a multi-celled animal is able to survive and reproduce, but a multi-celled animal, as the term aptly describes, is composed of different kinds of cells, each kind being specialized to perform different functions necessary for the success of the organism. For example, in a multi-celled animal, some cells might be specialized as skin cells, others as nerve cells, others to absorb food, of others as food cells to transport nutrients and oxygen to the other cells, and so on. Unlike single-celled animals, the individual cells in a multi-celled animal cannot survive on their own. If one is separated from the organism, then it will disintegrate. Okay, well, Wes, he talks very briefly about single cells and goes on very quickly to multicellular life, which comes along a lot later. You can't just overlook single cell life, and people often do. The problem is it's a whole new universe of miniaturization out there, something which is beyond really uh, most human comprehension is the world of unicellular life. Uh, it's a bit like quantum physics on the other hand, the largest, if you like, the out into the universe. Apologists, creationists love to hit upon this subject. They love to try and pick on something which most people are not going to understand. And it's very easy to twist all those. Um, Non-understanding is easy to give an explanation for which people can't argue with. So uh, I'm going to make it my sort of ambition to at least give a basis for unicellular life. And we'll start with the fact that there are two types of cell. The most basic and simple cells, um, which would have been back there in early life, are the prokaryotic cells, prokaryotes. Prokaryotic cells are, sim as I said, quite simple in comparison to the more complex cells known as eukaryotes. Now a prokaryote cell, um, they have a single circular chromosome, no nucleus as such, and few other organelles, as it's the, the other bits are called, organelles. And in order for them to replicate, um, they need a nucleic, nucleic acid, um, like DNA for instance, RNA. 
and it replicates um, resulting in basically uh, two chromosomes and these two chromosomes separate uh, and you get two daughter cells so you, I'm sure you've all seen cells division cell division <laughs> you know and that is the basic most basic form of cell division eukaryotic cells the more complex ones which came along probably uh, one and a half billion years later the first sort of um, noticeable ones and you're still going back two and a half billion years um, perhaps certainly two billion years you're going back to uh, the eukaryotic cells these have multiple chromosomes within them they also have a nucleus uh, many other organelles um, uh, they must be duplicated all these all these bits must be duplicated together before the cell divides not just the chromosome they also have numerous chromosomes um, as a DNA is uh, replicated during the stage and copies the organelles before cell division plus it makes proteins read that last bit okay because I knew I wouldn't remember it but it's just someone knows down there whether you understand that or not it doesn't matter at this point we've got to look really at prokaryotic cells as the earliest form of life and uh, we'll come on to that in a second okay so simple prokaryotic cells can be uh, all different sizes uh, different shapes they are different species um, today to put it into some perspective of cellular life more than 50% of all life, of the biomass, if you like, of this planet is made up of individual, you carry tiny little single-celled creatures. And to put it in a perspective of multicellular cellular to unicellular, if you consider yourself um, as a multi multicellular life form, the average human, um, and this is obviously a rough estimate, would have around 100 trillion cells within um, it, it, your own makeup, as it were, within your own multicellular uh, forming. But to put it into perspective with that, within your body within yourself um, if you like and living off of you um, in its own or their own little world we're looking at probably around 10,000 trillion um, of these tiny uh, uni, uh, you know prokaryotic small cells okay single cells unicells that puts it into a real perspective and when you start thinking like that, it's a wow, you know? Um, look at your lungs, for instance. We all know that you have a muscle that takes the air in and the air is expelled out. But what actually transfers? Uh, what absorbs that oxygen? What is it that turns the oxygen into carbon dioxide? Well, it has nothing to do with the actual human body. It's all to do with unicellular life. And that is living within you. And that is what's doing the work. Everything you eat, the, when you put food down your gullet, as it were, it's the unicellular life that's sorting it out for you. It's recycling the nutrients, if you like. It's releasing nitrates, um, which is a sort of usable form of nitrogen. And your body is made up of a massive different amount of and differing types of unicellular life. So when you put it into to, to some sort of perspective, when you start thinking um, of the world's oceans, for instance, the tiny, the plankton, the unicellular life that um, gives off all this um, oxygen, etc., in cyanobacteria and things like that across the globe, we depend upon unicellular life we would not exist without it and we have lived say we our ancestors have lived coinciding with unicellular and multicellular obviously life since time began and 
we are carriers carriers uh, in our own uh, as our own sense if you like we every individual is like a planet is to us uh, to unicellular life would see us as its planet you know gives you that sort of perspective so what is unicellular life well um, it's things like bacteria that's a prokaryote uh, the simplest form of a life is probably bacteria um, you have things like amoebas um, which are predatory or organisms and actually live off things like bacteria um, you have things like slime mold um, slime mold is a lot of sort of amoeba like cells and these amoeba like cells um, again um, they live in sort of and hunt in, in damp environments and live off other things like bacteria they form communities uh, and they can actually build uh, spore producing structures um, as they club together so it's not intelligence but it's the spores themselves are important in a time of um, not plenty the opposite what's the opposite of plenty time of drought as it were and they will remain until the conditions are right and then they can start and continue life so um, in, in a way that's a bit like seeds uh, seeding spores of fungus are the same uh, parasites for instance uh, you have the malaria parasite um, particularly well known this obviously travels with um, the mosquito and is injected into, into humans causes a lot of problems but again it's a unicellular form of life and there are many different varieties many different forms so many in fact you could dedicate your entire life to this subject and I think what creationists are doing here is really realizing that you're not going to spend your entire life on this subject so um, it's a very good way of getting a little gap to stick God in um, okay let me go on to something else let's have another listen to something else he said I'm going to attempt to explain to you what I like to call the blueprint theory which is actually an inescapable fact once it is broken down. There is obviously a variation of different kinds of species and animals and life forms, whether life forms transcend from other life forms or not. There are many different variations of life forms, even with, within uh, different variations of species. Now, species are groups of living things such as fruit flies, dogs, cats, horses, and humans. These species make up animal classifications such as fish, reptiles, birds, mammals, and primates. There's actually a hierarchy in biology called the Linnean Hierarchy. They are listed as follows. Species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and kingdom. According to evolution, the single-celled organism evolved into the more complex plant life and then to the more complex fish and then to the more complex reptile, then to birds, and so on, until ultimately you have primates. Now here's where I begin to uh, explain uh, the impossibility of blind evolution from single-celled organisms to primates. That is to say, in the beginning, uh, various single-celled organisms, billions upon billions, possibly a countless number of single-celled organisms scattered throughout a desolate earth, each evolving at the same rate and through the same lineage of species to plants, to fish, to reptiles, to birds, to mammals, and ultimately to humans. Not to mention this multitude of single-celled organisms not only blindly and accidentally going through the same biological process externally and all the complex biological makeup internally as each other, but also at the same time and for some unknown reason coming to a complete halt when it reaches humanity. That is to say when it reaches primates and ultimately humans. Oh, but you say uh, we're still evolving. Into what? What level of living things are more advanced than humans? What actual creature surpasses Homo sapiens? Well, as you can see, he's sort of gone well off track of what he was originally talking about, which is supposedly single cells and how they can evolve, um, which he doesn't really cover at all, even though this is the uh, generally way 
this video is supposed to be a the general thing this video is supposed to be about. There's a few, few points he brings up here which are um, <laughs> fun. Um, <clears throat> Things are evolving at the same rate, uh, single cells evolving at the same rate. Well, they may, may be evolving in the same time span, but they are not evolving at the same rate. Um, and this is obviously due to outside influences. With bacteria, for instance, they will freeze and uh, they're well known for surviving a freezing process. Of course, they won't do anything at that point. Um, they can then thaw out and continue to evolve if you like. Weather conditions, climatic conditions, um, types of toxins in the area, all these things can um, have a difference on the rate of evolving. The amount of food available obviously um, will have a different ev evolution rate. It will um, so things don't evolve at the same rate, that's what I'm saying, but some things can of course evolve quicker than other things and it's the wonders of nature of course now he says if what's what's um, humans are the ultimate thing as it apparently um, I've covered this thing this before what creature surpasses humans he says well a peregrine falcon does it has better eyesight and it can move at say 125 miles an hour obviously it can fly better than me as well even if I've got a jet with, even if I had a plane, it can fly better than me. Okay, uh, a shark. I'd like to see you out swim one, to be honest. Um, you know, I really would. I really would like you to see you, Wes, um, out swim a shark. Because uh, we're not really good in water, are we? No, not so good. Um, if you look at things on land, things like the cheetah, obviously, is the fastest land animal, around about 70 miles an hour, I think that'll run out. Um, and its prey, of course, being the second fastest thing. Go figure. I think I've said that one before as well. But uh, a giraffe. Uh, it's the tallest. Uh, we're not as tall as giraffes. We can't, I can't reach up into the trees quite the same. Okay, in theory, I could climb one. Not very good at climbing anymore. It's been too long since my ancestors were in the trees, perhaps. But um, I think the giant redwood tree. That's, you know, the giant trees uh, that we find. They're bigger than giraffes, they're still life. Um, blue whale, you know, that's still living on the most basic forms of life. Um, the minor, tiny creatures. And because it's in a different environment, it specializes in that environment and it is the best at being in that environment. All these things depend on the environment in which they live. We live in cities and towns and our own we built our, built up this uh, strange uh, landscape around us for our own use. And we are, of course, the best in that. Are we evolving into something else? Well, I'm personally not evolving into something else. I am me, I'm me, you know, that's it. I'm not going to evolve during my lifetime. Of course I'm not. But my ancestors probably relied a lot more on things like hunting, uh, things on skills like perhaps tree climbing, for instance. If we didn't have so many humans, and we have got a lot, and a much smaller population. And for that reason, the gene pool, you know, we can interbreed within that gene pool. And we'll get a lot of different traits, but none of them will probably say that we evolve. It will just be a thrown-in gene pool. Now, if you were to take that situation to something like, I need to climb trees in order to survive, um, obviously the best climber is going to find it himself or herself with the best mate. Uh, that person can provide so therefore I will you know I'm interested in getting off with that person. There are reasons for finding partners for instance. Probably not so much today. Being rich is a good one but um, I don't think we're going to evolve just by getting a rich partner. However if, for instance, other people were dying around you because they couldn't, um, you know, climb trees, it wouldn't take long for the human race to become arboreal once again. Those who would die off uh, that couldn't climb trees um, unless the tree climbers are providing for them, which is what we do today. We provide for others in a community type uh, environment. But take that away with our ancestors 
and you will find a reason for evolving. Obviously, the best offspring will be the best tree climbers. It wouldn't take long to get back in them trees. I hope I make that clear. But that's not really what we're supposed to be talking about here, is it? We're just going off on a tangent like uh, most of your apologists always do. So, uh, is there anything else I want to cover? No. We'll go straight on to another one of your crackpot bloody speeches. Give me a theory based upon scientific evidence and observation. You can't because it's not there. It does not exist. Let's move on. If there was initially literally one single-celled organism to spring off all life, where would it gain its superpowers to survive, let alone begin to evolve? I don't think any biologist will say that life began with literally one extremely lucky single-celled organism billions of years ago. Let us continue. It would be impossible for blind, unguided evolution to produce species of the same biological makeup from several single-celled organisms throughout an empty, desolate planet. Ah, here we go again. Right, you want to know what this scientific thing is that, uh, that, that is, makes all this possible? Well, it's actually called the Theory of Evolution Through Natural Selection. Yes, it is. Um, that's... I'm sorry if you don't understand that, but the, the, I will try and get to that as we go. Right, superpowers. Uh, yes, what gives life its superpowers? This superpower. Um, well, it doesn't have that sort of heart of thunder or, uh, or life. I mean, it's sort of the spark that gives it life. It, it's um, Everything is explainable. Um, everything is explainable because they're, they're, it's made of natural earthbound materials, believe it or not, stardust, you know. These are naturally explainable materials where life comes from. There's no, there's no weird little god gene or anything. Um, however, how could life um, have started? Well, uh, did life start with one particular cell? We don't know. It could have started and stopped many times before it took a foothold. And it's the cells that took a foothold that we're interested in, really. The others that died out, they, oh, I don't know if they did or not. This is a possibility, and that is all. But we do know that cells did take a foothold, and uh, we, here we are today, through evolution, through natural selection. Not blind forces um, that you talk about. It's not blind, it's directed by observable outside influences. And that is the whole point of evolution through natural selection. Observable outside influences. I can't say that enough. Okay. Right. How did life start on an empty, desolate planet? Well, it wouldn't be much bloody good if it was... How did life start on a planet full of life, would it? Um, no, it had to be an empty, desolate planet. Um, for obvious reasons. You know, it's interesting that life has now been created within the laboratory. I'm sure you've all heard that. But when this, was, when this happened with this... Um, very basic form of cellular bacteria, um, single cell, unicell bacteria, bacteria. People said, but that already exists. You haven't created life because life's already existing. You can't win really, can you, with, uh, with um, this type of mental thinking. I don't know how to counteract that sort of thinking, to be honest. However, um, I'll just go on to the next bit, you're an arse. There is simply no other way around this fact. Single-celled life forms cannot blindly evolve into several different species of the same kind and same biology, ultimately ending up into just one intellectual thinking and reasoning life form, namely humans. If there were countless single-celled organisms at the beginning of all life, all springing uh, into a process of blind, unguided evolution, they would all evolve differently. Ultimately, an untold diversity of intellectual thinking and reasoning life forms like humans would inhabit our planet. Well, I think what we've got to do really is have a look at how you get from a prokaryotic cell to a eukaryotic cell, which is a far more complex cell, before you really even get on to uh, multicellular life. So, it's up to me to try and explain it in simple terms if I can. To start with, look at these early life. 
um, these prokaryotic cells and this bacteria. Bacterium evolved to produce things like um, mitochondria and, and um, chloroplasts, for instance, two of the main ingredients in, um, in modern life. How do they get into a eukaryotic cell? Well, basically it was a process known as symbiosis or endosymbiosis in, in this particular case. Now, um, cells would absorb this bacterium, um, this ba bacterium that produced these items, as it were. Within it, it obviously didn't digest it, and these organisms found that they could live with inside other cells. The, the parent cell would be supplying the nutrients, and in return, these um, bacterium would then be producing um, useful products like mitochondria, mitochondria and chloroplasts to uh, the parent. So what you got was a symbiotic relationship, an advantage from uh, these particular types of bacterium. Over time, over evolution, they basically um, endosymbosized together. And this happened many times in, with it, throughout the bacterium world, as it were, and throughout the monocell world. Now, why are things important? Uh, at cyanobacteria, for instance, uh, you... Oh, and what, how do we know that that was true? Uh, I could just be making that up. I haven't really produced any evidence. Well, modern evidence, um, it turned up as a theory over 100 years ago to start with, but modern evidence has shown this is exactly what happened. You have, for starters, living intermediates today in the bacterium world. You, you don't find that so much in the higher creatures, but within bacterium, you, there are many ancient intermediates, if you like, um, species around. Vast, vast subject, believe me. Um, you could study it for a whole life and still not know all about it. But you have to rely sometimes on those that do spend the whole life doing just such things. Okay, uh, also within, within cells you find things like double, triple and multiple or quadruple membranes. These membranes suggest this symbiosis from other bacterium. Um, and of course, uh, the DNA, it traces, the DNA traces um, which we find today and of course can do things like um, gene sequencing, etc. Which, which does seem to um, correspond, if you like, with the exact theory. Uh, cyanobacteria, which is uh, one of these things we should talk about, are, is responsible for oxygenating the earth. Uh, and the extinctions of many of the earlier bacteria that uh, really couldn't adapt to the oxygenation of the earth. Um, they also fix uh, nitrogen as nitrates. And this is important food as it were. All living things are really using these nitrates. In fact in many plants in particular uh, you will find they have special roots just to fix these Back to nitrate bacterium upon them. In paddy fields that they grow rice, they often put in amongst it uh, these ferns, for instance, these floating ferns, and these ferns have these roots that fix these nit nitrates. They specially grow that bacteri bacteria on them. They have evolved to keep that bacteria with them. Another sort of symbiosis in a much larger and creature, in this case, uh, plant. Why do they do that? Well, when the, when the fern dies, it uh, goes to the bottom and supplies nitrates uh, to, or nitrites in this case, to, you know, the uh, rice and the, as a fertilizer, it's a cheap way of fertilizing. If you've ever had a fish tank, for instance, and you've tried to set it up, you have to set it up for several weeks. Aerobic bacteria are needed to build up the uh, right amount of the nitrate, nitrite producing uh, bacteria. A friend of mine once cleaned his fish tank out and uh, the next day I went round all his fish were dead. I, I said, what have, you done to, what have you done to your fish tank? He said, oh, they all died. I said, well, when you cleaned it out, what did you do? He said, well, I boiled all the gravel. 
Well, he put boiling water over all the gravel and cleaned it all out. I said, I think I know why you, we've killed them then, because you've really taken away the lungs of that fish tank. So bacteria is that important in higher life forms. So um, cyanobacteria made the transition from single to multicellular life many times, it seems. And thanks to modern gene sequencing, we can look back um, upon uh, the history, if you like, of cyanobacteria. They took, uh, let me have a look here, the scientists followed 1,254 species of modern cyanobacteria using gene sequencing creating 11,000 phylogenic trees from each one. Okay. So, and through that, lo and behold, they also found this proof of cyanobacteria actually becoming multicellular but then becoming unicellular again several times. So the transition between unicellular and multicellular is, um, is one that's probably been a bit of an accordion, in and out, in and out. Right, uh, that's explained at least how you get from eukaryote to pi uh, Oh God, I'm so tired now from trying to explain that. Don't do it at the end. To prokaryote to eukaryote cells, that's explained that bit. Oh, I feel better now. I'm sorry if that was long. I hope you understood it. <laughs> Simple as I can make it. Perhaps you want to... I'll go on to the next bit. Let's just take you back slightly, just so we can get a little bit more understanding. Mitochondria, for instance, which is one of those most important things. Why is it important? Well, it produces... It's an organelle found in eukaryotic cells, which hopefully I've covered by now. Now, it's a cellular power plant and it supplies adenosine triosulfate, which is um, very important, believe it or not, it's a little if for energy, and involves other functions, it's such as signalling, for instance, and cell differentiation, um, and of course growth. We are multicellular eukaryotic cells, if you like, we are made of such things. Now, in some cells, you only have a single mitochondria, mitochondria. But in others you can have many thousands of different uh, mit mitochondrial proteins, as it were. Now uh, they depend, they vary really depending on the tissue type and the species. And there are many different species. So they are important in the sense of the growth of multicellular life. Okay. I hope that's explained that. We haven't quite got onto higher forms of life yet, but it is a long process, and it was a long process, so uh, bear with me. Ah, now, Weds, you definitely need a dim bulb award, in my opinion, um, for your amazing misconceptions of evolution. Um, the next bit I'm going to play uh, really explains the way that you think things were created and not the way things, e not the way that evolution works. I'll just play a little piece of it, it's a bit long. Go to the main video if you want to hear Wes's um, uh, speech as it were, because I don't want to take things completely out of context, but you've got to listen to this bullshit. Now for my comparisons. Let's compare single-celled organisms with ink. Take four buckets of ink in four parts of the world and empty each bucket of ink in four different rivers of the world uh, with the rivers uh, swishing the ink in all directions. If the rivers cause the ink to form the shape of a fish in one river you have a miracle that's apparently not unguided because of the obvious intricacy. Yeah, I'm not going to play anymore. It, it goes on like that. So it's, it's a long speech. This is his theory. Um, he thinks evolution is if you do that in every river, basically, and it all comes together and makes humans. Um, not quite the way it works, Wes. Sorry to say. Uh, blind forces are not at work here. If blind forces were at work, of course, then... Um, well, that would be impossible, wouldn't it? Something which, strangely, creationists are always trying to point out the impossible. Um, but the most impossible thing is some magical being came along and went kapoof. That is impossible, mate. 
Um, say mate, obviously not, but um, let's just let you play us out on this this last bit. I'll, I'll see if I can I can put it on here. Um, let's listen along to you. Now let's go back to the beginning of life, prior to the single-celled organisms. Single-celled organisms themselves would not be alike, nowhere even close to the same biological fashion as each other, given blind, unguided evolution uh, from so whatever blind. theory you could possibly come up with for where single-celled organisms themselves came from in the first place. There would be diverse variations altogether of the single-celled organisms, and that so-called single-celled organisms would be so diverse in their biological makeup and fashion, they, they would not all be defined as single-celled organisms. They are diverse. They all Isn't vary that? of some alien fashion, completely unknown from each other. The concept that they were all fashioned in only the biological external and internal manner of the single-celled organisms we're familiar with, scattered on the earth to give rise to other life forms with no other beginning life forms, and totally different than single cells to keep them company, is unrealistic and blind, unintended beginnings with all things possible. Yeah, the way you're thinking like is unrealistic. It a bag of candy that contained... 900 ah, trillion pieces of candy in the bag. Then you open the bag up, and they are all blue M&Ms. You are correct in concluding it was no coincidence. Come on. Doggy, this is my doggy. Uh, 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 uh. All right, you come up here. We'll see. Oh. Ready? Ooh. <laughs> see, my singing and my playing can attract dogs. Ooh. Let's tune it. Tuning up, obviously. Uh, good night.